Well, after Cain killed Abel in Genesis chapter 4, the Lord comes to, to Cain and he asks him, where is your brother Abel? To which he famously said, am I my brother's keeper? And then during Jesus' ministry, he actually gives us the answer to that question. He answers that affirmatively in the parable of the Good Samaritan. It turns out that we are to be on the lookout for anyone who is in need that comes along of our path. They were required to be sensitive to them in their needs. But what about when we see a brother or sister who sins? What responsibility, well, if any, do we have? I want you to turn your Bibles today to the first part of or to Matthew chapter 18, beginning at verse 15. And we're going to look at the first part of this um, passage here. So this is verse is eight, chapter 18, verses 15. We won't get quite to 20, but, um, but, but look at that little passage. There's a lot just in those few verses that we'll be spending some time with today. Well, this is a passage that will actually uh, turn on its head our ideas about what we think the church is and about what we think uh, it may be about dealing with sin uh, amongst our brothers and sisters. So here's the context of this passage. So Jesus told uh, his disciples the parable of the lost sheep. And then immediately after that, he begins to talk about, well, what happens when a brother or sister goes wayward in the church? And then he begins to talk about this. And it begins in verse 15 with, if your brother sins against you. And if you actually look at the original Greek, in the, in the oldest manuscripts, in the oldest manuscripts, that part against you isn't there. So it just says if your brother or sister sins in the oldest transcripts. And so that means that the brother or sister sinned isn't necessarily against you, but their sin causes you concern for their spiritual welfare and the effect that it's having on the whole church. That's the context here. How do we deal with that? pastorally in the church. Now, we're talking here about fellow disciples of Jesus, first of all. Let's get that context right. These are people who have committed their lives to following Jesus. You know, they've been baptized. They have committed their lives. They are walking, uh, people that claim to be walking with the Lord. Um, we're not talking about seekers so a lot of people might be seeking who are attending the church, and they might be seeker for years, but they're not genuine disciples yet. So we're not talking about seekers. So you don't deal with sin when somebody is just learning about Jesus. Does that make sense? If you begin with, well, you've got to get this right, guess what? They're never going to come to faith. You begin with the gospel. You begin with Jesus and allow the Holy Spirit to convert their hearts. So we're not talking about people outside of the church. We're not talking about seekers who may be attending the church, but we're talking about people who have committed their lives to following Jesus. Now, we're also not talking about people who've broken the law. So if somebody breaks the law, then we have an obligation to report them to the authorities. You know, we can't keep that hidden in the church if somebody has committed murder, for instance. You know, we have an obligation to, to report that. Now, why should a fellow disciple be engaged in sin? You say, well, if they're committed their life to Jesus, you know, why would they be engaged in this? Well, believe it or not, you know, there are people that may be doing things that they don't even realize are wrong. You know, they may be young in their faith, and nobody's ever pointed out to them that certain behaviors are, are wrong biblically. You know, people don't automatically change just because, you know, they've committed their life to following Jesus. Jesus. It takes time for transformation to take place. But God wants to use our lives to help be an instrument of that transformation. That's why we belong to a church, so that we can, we can speak into each other's lives. So let me just give you a few examples that I've seen uh, as a pastor. I've known people in their faith who, who have used tarot cards. 
you know, in their past. So they use tarot cards as a way to kind of gain direction in their lives. Uh, but they don't realize that the scriptures actually speak against divination and fortune telling because it's trusting in something other than the Lord. And believe it or not, you know, you can, you can confront somebody with this and say, oh, I didn't know. And, and, and many times they'll just leave it and go, I didn't realize that that was wrong. But they needed somebody to come into their life to say, hey, this is wrong. Now, there's a common example of enga uh, is engaging in sexual activity outside of marriage. You know, we live in a society where, where anything goes. You know, sex runs rampant, and there's no guardrails in our society. You know, our, our, basically, we can do whatever we want with whomever we want, however we want. It doesn't matter. But the scripture teaches us that the only appropriate place for sex is within a covenantal relationship of marriage between a man and a woman. And people come to faith and they don't realize this. You know, where the norm is living with other people, they don't have any sense of what the norm is. And they need someone to show them the way. And remember, we're talking about committed Christians here. We're talking about people who've committed their lives to following Jesus, not seekers. So the moment somebody comes into the church, you don't go, oh, no, that's no. We, we love people into the kingdom. We bring people to faith. And then once they've made the commitment, then we share how to, what does it mean to live out and to be a Christian. Now, besides... Um, ignorance, which is what we're talking about, ignorance of sin, you will also find disciples who know their behavior is wrong, but they think they can get away with it because it isn't hurting anybody else. They want to keep it a private matter, but they don't realize that sin impacts not just us personally, but on the spiritual realm, it impacts everyone in the church. That the whole church is being influenced by that because we're actually bringing it into the church. So we're claiming to be disciples, and yet we're not living that way. And at the same time, we will also counter very frequently within the church those who are struggling with addictions. And these are disciples who know their behavior is wrong, but they can't stop on their own. Keeping it in the dark is not an option. As brothers and sisters, we must walk with people through this journey. It's a journey to wholeness, and it's not going to happen over time. They're going to keep falling, and we need to be there to love them through this. They're not going to be able to change immediately because there's, there's a lot of physical, emotional, and spiritual reasons why they're in addiction. And the church's view then is to keep walking with them through it, not judging them. Addiction's hard, and so many people struggle with addiction. Now, before we get to Jesus' prescription for how the church is to address sin in our midst, I just want to make a couple of observations about Jesus' view of the church and how it operates, because we have to really understand that. Now, firstly, Jesus imagines a very different kind of church than, 21st, than the 21st century American church. It's very different. You know, so many churches today are packed with people who have only a casual relationship with the church. You know, they're there to be fed. And as long as the church meets my needs, well, I'll keep going. But if I'm stopped, if I'm no longer fed anymore, well, you know, I'm, I'm just as happy going somewhere else. And they move on, and, and that's the relationship with the church. But for Jesus, this isn't so. For him, the church is an intimate, safe community consisting of brothers and sisters who are part of of the same family. And so look around. You know, Jesus said, this is your family. I mean, more so than your physical families, this is your family. Everyone is to genuinely love one another and are committed to each other. No matter what may come in life, we're committed to each other. No matter what you do, we're committed to each other. Does that make sense? Now, because of that mutual commitment, we can speak, we have the right to speak into each other's lives without getting defensive. Addressing sin, therefore, comes out of a genuine love and concern, not out of judgment or a sense of superiority. 
Because we're all sinners, right? It is never meant to tear down, but to provide opportunities for growth in faithfulness. And the fact of the matter is, we, we all need people to speak into our lives to, to show us the ways that we fall short, right? Now, second, sin in whatever form is never to be tolerated in the church. And that was that, that Ezekiel 33 passage that Julie was reading earlier. It's pretty strong stuff, isn't it? Sin affects the entire community and puts our brothers and sisters who are engaged in it, an unrepented sin in spiritual danger. So it's a serious thing in the church. And therefore, every member of the church has the responsibility to ensure that sin doesn't proliferate. Now, that doesn't mean that we should be policing each other's lives, looking out for dirt. That's not what it means at all. <laughs> On the contrary, Jesus imagines that sin will be discovered in the course of a natural personal, of a normal personal relationship with, with someone that we know. You know, as we get closer to them, you know, we see them for who they are. And so we can address them with a sense of sensi sensitivity and with minimal publicity. And third, and this may come as a surprise to some of you, Jesus' view of the church, uh, about Jesus' view of the church, is that it's not appropriate for the pastor to get involved early on. Did you hear that? It's not appropriate for the pastor to get involved early on. So how do we typically address a problem in the church? Well, I can tell you how because I see it happen over and over again. Someone in the congregation expresses concern about somebody. You know, they're concerned it might be a sin or it might not be a sin, but whatever, it might be a sin. They go directly to the wardens. They say, this person is doing this. And then the wardens come to me and they say, now do something about it. <laughs> That's the pattern. Now, what is wrong with this model? It assumes that the members of the church have no authority. It assumes that you're just, you know, somebody who just is a place sitter that comes to listen. But Jesus gives each of us authority. We have authority and we have a responsibility. Now, notice Jesus doesn't say anything in this passage about church leadership getting involved, at least initially. It doesn't say, now go to your leader. It doesn't say that. Your brother and sister's sin must be your concern, not the leadership's concern. You care about the person. You love that person. That's, the, that's, the, that's how you approach them. And you have credibility to speak into their lives because of the relationship that you've built with them. And if you don't have that kind of relationship with them, then build it before you come and talk about their sin. Does that make sense? You have the authority if you, if you build into that relationship. If the pastor is the first person to address the person, it can make the offender feel overly exposed. And if he disagrees, where does he turn to appeal his case? There's no one left to turn to, right? You know, the authority is speaking to them right there. And I'll tell you, you know, having done this for a lot of years, most of these cases don't end well. You know, uh, so the brother or sister ends up leaving the church, and guess what? Taking their sin with them, and it never gets resolved. And so sin is passed on from one church to the next church to the next church. And that's what's happening in the church today. And it's not supposed to be like that. It's our responsibility not to send it to somewhere else. It's our responsibility. Moreover, getting the wardens and the pastor involved early, that you've turned in what should have been a private matter between you and that person, now into a public affair, and this is how gossip erupts in the church. Because now everybody knows about this person's sin, and they're talking about it. And it wasn't supposed to be that way. That's not the way Jesus intended. 
And if you just loved your brother or sister enough, it wouldn't need to get out there. So what are we supposed to do? So what are we supposed to do? Well, Jesus says that when we become aware of the sin of a brother or sister, he said, go and tell him his fault. And the Greek word here is much much like our English word to confront. It's not a gentle word and includes the ideas of, of bringing it into the light, of trying to bring the person to see what they've done is wrong and then correcting them. That's, what, that's what's meant here. And the situation assumes that the person raising the issue is in the right, and the behavior is self-evidently wrong. Now, in practice, matters are not always so straightforward, are they? And it behooves the person taking the initiative to make sure that this sin is not simply personal preference. Because we're not talking about personal preference here. We're talking about sin that we can identify scripturally as being sin. You must pray. You must search the scriptures. You must check your heart. But you must not ignore the sin. You are your brother's and sister's keeper. Every one of us. Now, confronting a person with sin, even when it's a good friend isn't easy, is it? You know, we love to help people who are in need, but we're really hesitant about getting involved if it involves sin. We are afraid of how they're going to react. We may also be hesitant because we see our own sin. You know, we know that we're not perfect. Am I better than my brother or sister? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because guess what? Next week, that person may point out your own sin to you. But that sin, but there is a difference between sin that we confess and turn away from, which is what we regularly do, and those who are engaged in sin and refuse to repent. And that's what we're talking about. That's what needs to be addressed. Sin in which the person refuses to repent of and continues to engage in. Now, when you become aware of sin, you are to act with sensitivity and with minimal publicity. The principle set out in these verses is of minimal exposure. Other people being brought in only when this more private approach does not work. We always begin with a private approach. And the ideal solution would be something is worked out between you and that person in private and nobody else ever knows. Now, there are cases when your brother and sister will not listen to you, even after you've been, you know, kind enough to do that. And in those cases, we must consider the possibility that we've misjudged them and take it to prayer. And if you've discovered that you were wrong, just go back and apologize to them and say, look, you know, I, you weren't wrong, wrong in judging them, but you were wrong in misjudging them. And that's what you, you know, go back and you say, I'm sorry I did that. I, w- I was wrong. But there are other reasons that uh, a brother or sister might deny any, any wrongdoing. Um, they may see it as criticism. You know, how dare you criticize me and judge me. Now, what Paul clearly says is we never judge the world, but we judge one another. And by judging one another, not, not in a judgmental kind of way, but, you know, we, we see into each other's lives because we know each other. And so, yes, we, you know, if, if we see something that isn't right, you know, we, we, we have that kind of relationship to, to be able to talk to each other. They may say, they may... Um, have an unhealed wound. And the circumstances remind them of that previous hurt. And so what happens, and this happens so often, is they conflate what's happened in the past with what's going on now, and they're talking about in the present. And, and they're responding in the same way. And this happens more often than we realize. And you know what the Lord is really saying in those situations? Is that he wants to heal that wound. And maybe that wound actually is the reason why you're engaged in this activity. But 
but it's the wound that needs to be addressed that the Lord might be bringing up. And we just have to be aware of that. We carry with us the wounds of our, of our backgrounds in the things that we do, and the Lord doesn't want us to keep us trapped by those wounds. He wants to set us free. And they may refuse to reflect and to really take it to prayer. So whenever a brother or sister accuses us of something, you know, we don't have to say anything in the moment. You know, we, we can actually take it to the Lord and see if he reveals anything that we need to repent of. And if he does reveal something, you know, then great. You know, it, it confess it, you know, repent, and, 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 and turn away from it. But if the, if the Lord doesn't reveal anything after that person has said something to you, then go back and continue the dialogue with the person. And we do that because we're committed to one another. Now, when the initial one-on-one -on -one approach has not been successful, then we need to take more drastic action, Jesus says. And so in verse 16, he, he says, But if, you, if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now, again, there's no suggestion that any of these people are leaders of the church. So you don't need to get a leader involved at this point. You know, just take along, you know, somebody else that can, uh, that can be there. The purpose of these uh, one or two extras is to back the concern of the initiator and to endorse the assessment of the matter raised in the sin. And so the, you, that the united testimony of two or three will provide more authority. Hey, this is not just what this person thinks. This really is true. This is what the scriptures say. Now, as a last resort, Jesus says in verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. Now, the object of this gathering, which would include the pastor and other leaders, is not to pronounce judgment, but to strengthen the pastoral testimony in the hope that the offender will, will listen and yield. The testimony of the whole local discipleship community adds credibility that the offender can recognize that this is not just a personal grievance but it really is sin to be serious about. The gathering of, the, of this church in this way is not to be seen as a political stunt, but it's, and it's not a way to extract power, you know, saying submit or else, but it's completely pastoral. Hey, sister, hey, brother, you know, we're getting gathered here because we're concerned about you. We love you. And we're just concerned right now that you're involved in something that puts you in spiritual danger. So that's, that's the idea of it. it. It comes out of a genuine, you know, love and care, not power, not um, coercion. You know, you're, 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 you're loving the person by coming together. Now, if after such care of the whole community, the offender still is unwilling to acknowledge their sin, at that point, the offender can properly be regarded as no longer fit for the community. And so to treat somebody like a Gentile, like Jesus says, seems to me to stand as a person who's no, who no longer finds a place among God's holy people. But that state can change if the offender later decides to repent. You know, it's, as long as the Lord hasn't come back, they're welcome to come back. And they, they should be welcome with open arms. You know, the parable of the good, you know, the, the parable of the, is it good, what, yeah, we're, prodigal son, thank you. <laughs> it wasn't coming, I was like, no, that's not the right one. <laughs> the prodigal son. Yeah, the prodigal son, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, unfortunately, modern examples of what Jesus has just laid out are few and far between. I mean, I've never seen a church operate this way. Never. But I want to. And I really believe that's what Jesus lays out for us. Typically, churches either ignore the sin and fear of, of you know, just 
having that person, um, uh, you know, run out or, or offending that person. Or they turn the sin into opportunities to exert power and generate gossip. Many have been abused by the church in these situations. And as a result, people either leave the church altogether or they go to another church where their sin will eventually reappear because it's never dealt with. We mustn't be like that, St. James. We must be different than all these other examples. Rather, we must be a church that mutually submits to one another. You know, we all have sin. And if a brother or sister um, points that out to us, we must not get offended. At the very least, we need to take it to prayer. They might be wrong, and that's okay, but we take it to prayer, we, and we, we allow the Lord to examine our hearts, and we can go back to them because we're in relationship with them. A really healthy church is not a church where there's no sin in the church. There's no such church, at least not this side of eternity. But a really healthy church is one where each of its members are humble and teachable. And when sin is brought up to us, we, we address it seriously because we want to grow and become the dis- kinds of disciples that Jesus wants us to be. In that kind of church, every issue of sin will be addressed in a conversation between two people who love each other and no one else will ever know. Because it'll never have to be brought up any further. And wouldn't we all like that? So that we we live in the light of our loving each other. And I think that's the ideal that Jesus is laying before us. May give us grace to become that kind of church. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for